Good morning, and it's great seeing all of you here, and thank you, thank you for coming to the session. Uh, I'm Ted, I'm a program manager on the Azure Machine Learning team, and uh, Doug here is a distinguished engineer in Microsoft Research, and I think you've heard a lot about the announcements yesterday with Project Brainwave, and what Doug will be going through will be a deep dive into what Project Brainwave is, and then I'll talk about how you can use Project Brainwave. So we'll start off with Doug, and just uh, giving you an overview of Project Brainwave, and. Uh, and how you can use that to accelerate everything. Great, thank you, Ted. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. So we're gonna do 25 minutes for my half and 25 minutes-ish for Ted's, and this can be interactive. So if you have questions at any point, feel free to put your hand up. We have, we have enough time, I think, for, to have some online discussion. Uh, for those of you looking at my right eye and wondering what happened, it wasn't a bar fight and it wasn't a technical <laughs> disagreement. I'm a squash <laughs> player and I took a racket to the face uh, Saturday morning, unfortunately I had protective glasses on, so uh, there's no problems here, but it does look a little, uh, a little <laughs> grim, although it looked a lot worse Saturday morning. Okay, so this is a really exciting moment for us because we are taking this work that we've been doing across the company to accelerate our internal AI and bringing it to our customers. And so, uh, you know, I, I run a team in research that built a, a big chunk of the Brainwave architecture, which runs on top of the FPGA infrastructure that we've built. And Ted is the, the product owner that's, that's really running the service. And so really, Ted is your, your right point of contact. I'm always happy to answer questions and forward email to Ted. Uh, and since he's the hard product truth guy, he's going to give you some serious technical depth. Uh, you know, I was a professor for 10 years, and so... Uh, if I flip into professor mode, you know, Ted may come up with a hook and pull me off. Okay, so, so what is Project Brainwave? It's a hardware architecture. Think like, just like the NVIDIA Volta, uh, Google TPU, Nirvana's chip. There's a, about, about a zillion startups building their own, what we call NPUs for neural processing units. So, so Project Brainwave is a hardware architecture. The reason we call it Project is because we don't have an official product name for it yet. So it's still, uh, it's still in the research project nomenclature phase. And so we've chosen with the hardware architecture to synthesize it down to FPGAs rather than building our own custom chip. And that's a deliberate choice. And we think at least at this point in time, it's been the right choice for us. And it's given us a tremendous amount of flexibility and also the ability to get into a performance leadership position for DNN inference. And we've had a great collaboration with our partner, Intel, who's been working with us to optimize the system. And we've really benefited from their technology. So I know I have a bunch of, bunch of friends from Intel in, in, in the room here. So thank you all for, for the great partnership and support. So I think what I'll do to start off is play a short video that, uh, that we had produced. And to give you a sense of our overall FPGA project and, and, and really what we've done over the past few years. It's been a a really interesting ride because we've, we've been able to leverage this for all sorts of different data center workloads. Project Brainwave is the latest attempt or the latest iteration that drives it for deep learning. And so uh, let me start with that and then we'll, uh, we'll continue. In this talk. era of exponential data growth, data centers need a faster, more intelligent cloud to keep up with growing appetites for compute power. Since the earliest days of cloud computing, Microsoft has been innovating with specialized processors to give CPUs a boost for critical workloads. Among accelerator options, FPGAs offer a unique combination of speed and flexibility, ideal for keeping pace with rapid innovation. On FPGAs, data flows through programmable silicon-level logic blocks that process instructions in parallel, a perfect approach for big data. Our unique board level architecture uses Intel FPGAs to augment our data center with an interconnected, configurable compute layer. Microsoft leads the industry in transforming data centers with programmable hardware. We were the first to prove the value of FPGAs for cloud computing, first to deploy them at cloud scale, and first to use them to accelerate enterprise level applications, beginning with Bing. Our leadership in accelerated networking delivered the world's fastest cloud. Our pioneering with FPGAs for distributed computing paved the way for breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. 
our FPGAs enable real-time AI with industry-leading price for performance. And this is just the beginning. Microsoft has an aggressive roadmap of platform, architecture, and algorithmic innovation ahead. Azure will remain the world's most intelligent cloud. Okay, so that's a little bit of the project history, and I think you saw from 2016 to 2018, we were building a lot of this AI capability onto our network of FPGAs that we've provisioned within the company, and really what the announcement today or this week has been is about bringing that to our Azure customers. And so we'll talk, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the architecture and why it's disruptive and, and, and how we generated these levels of performance, and then 10 we'll go into what the service looks like, how you can access it. I think one thing that's really important to understand is that when you, when you work with raw FPGAs, people typically write something called HDL, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, hardware description language in a language like VHDL or Verilog. And really these are languages where you code like you're designing a chip. And then you will take that, that hardware code and run it through a, a different tool chain or a different compiler, you know, a hardware compiler. And then you can either take that to a, a fab and produce your own custom chip, or you can run it through a different flow and synthesize it onto an FPGA. And of course, the FPGAs, you can change the image you know, every second if you want to, although it's hard to generate programs that fast. And so uh, the, the, what's really nice here is that we've built an engine, that's what Project Brainwave is, that has its own language so, you, so we can write down to it in a higher level language. Right, so when you have a DNN, uh, we can work with customers to map that DNN to the engine rather than dropping all the way down to the, the, the bare metal of the FPGA. So it's a much easier developer experience than working with the raw FPGAs. In some sense, we're abstracting the complexity of that programmable hardware chip uh, from our developers and users. But the really nice thing about that, that model is that we can actually keep turning the engine and turning the crank and improving that hardware continuously under the hood. Almost like you know, you get a new like when you're using CPUs, you get a new optimized CPU every month without actually changing the chip in the socket. So as we generate uh, more optimized versions of the the architecture, we can slide those in, and they'll remain software compatible with the models that you port. And so you just get this continually improving level of performance. I mean, Ted knows that uh, we we brought up you know the convolutional networks, the ResNet 50 model that's our launch offering, and Three or four weeks ago, I think it was maybe 10 times as slow as it is today because the team was just tuning it and they brought the latencies down until we're now at about 1.8-ish milliseconds per image. And so as customers, you'll see those, you know, those, those improvements uh, come in a steady stream. You know, we rev the hardware more than once a month. And one of the really neat things about that model is that when there's a discovery in the deep learning community, so we see some research paper published with some new operator, some new activation function, some new algorithm that's substantially similar but different from what we're currently deploying. We can actually pull those innovations in very fast and then roll out a new image. So it's like your hardware infrastructure that are running the models in your enterprises, for those of you who are you know, enterprise customers, will, will have a steady stream of advances you know, following closely behind their discoveries in the research literature. So it really keeps you up to date and keeps you in a, in a super compelling position. All right, so I'll, I'll go, on, you know, go on with a few more uh, details here. I don't think we want to see the video again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we talk a lot in this release about real-time AI. And I'd like to be uh, very precise about what that is. So I think many of you know this, so uh, apologies for the redundant information. What many chips today do that in the DNN acceleration community is, is something called batching. And the idea behind batching is you take N requests, where N could be two or four or eight, or 256 or 512 or 1024, it doesn't have to be a power of two, but it often is, and you lump those individual requests together into one big batch or package, and then you ship that off to the hardware all at once. And the reason that, they, that uh, that works with a lot of the chips like GPUs and TPUs today is that the chip doesn't have enough bandwidth, enough memory bandwidth to keep one request busy. So you get low utilization of the chip if you only send it a single request. So by sending it a thousand requests, the, the chip can work on 
the first chunk of each of the thousand requests and then the second chunk of each of the thousand requests and then all thousand finish at once. The aggregate performance you get out of the chip is thus much higher, but the latency you see is actually much lower or much higher, it's much slower. And so today, in, typically people have to make a trade-off between do I want to run with low latency or do I want to run with high throughput, which means low cost. And so what we really tried to do with this real-time AI model is eliminate that distinction. And so we got rid of batching. And so the chip runs at nearly full throughput with a single request. So you send one request uh, to the Project Brainwave service. The chip gets very high utilization and it sends you the answer uh, as soon as it's processed. And then you can send another request. And so in some sense, you're sending a stream of individual requests and you're getting a stream of responses back. And so you don't have to play games in software where you're batching up a thousand separate requests, waiting for them to arrive, batching them together, doing the data marshalling, shipping that whole big package over, then waiting and getting the results back. So it really simplifies the way you use this system. You don't have to think, well, what's my latency bound? How much should I batch? How much will it cost me to do that? We just say we provide a single interface. You just send requests as fast as you can and the responses come back really fast. And, and that's really what you want in real-time scenarios. When you're, when you're on a, uh, we've, we've talked about Jable as our lead customer or one of our lead customers, they have a manufacturing line. They don't want to see 256 boards fly by on the manufacturing line before they <laughs> ship the, the images off to a DNN to be processed and figure out which of the boards are bad because by then they're, they're down and you know, way down the, the, the line in the next stage being incorporated into products, right? So they, send an, they, look at the, they look at the circuit board, they send an image, it comes back good or bad. If it's bad, they pull it off. If it's good, it keeps going. And they can keep up with the rate of the line. In fact, they can speed up the line now because of those capabilities. So for, for deep learning, the deep learning is starting to cover many, many areas. And initially, it's being integrated in workflows for things that are pretty common in terms of people's capabilities. Vision, language, speech, question and answer, knowledge. But what's happening more and more is as we're discovering new uses that humans aren't good at, those are a little bit harder to find. Things like sales lead generation, uh, malware detection, bug finding. There's just many, many, many applications of deep learning that we're discovering work well that we, didn't, we just didn't know because we haven't evolved to process those workloads as humans the way we have with speech and vision. And so this, these capabilities are growing and becoming broader and broader. We're seeing them get incorporated gradually into many of Microsoft's products and our competitors are doing the same thing. And then it turns out that many of these use cases end up being real time on inference. And so if you're having an interactive session or you're integrating with some live process like a manufacturing line or you've got a thousand cameras in a, in a retail store and you want to know what's happening at any given point. You know, is somebody shoplifting? Is some uh, product out of stock on the shelves? Has a refrigerator door been left open? You know, these are all things that you want to find out as soon as they happen. And so that low latency is really critical. And by eliminating that trade-off between cost and speed, we can now integrate real-time AI into our processes with really no, no, uh, no consequences or no trade-offs. So we think it's a pretty exciting, pretty exciting offering. Now, previously to this release, the DNNs have been pretty constrained by performance and power, which is why we're starting to see all these new accelerators be generated. And because these accelerators tend to be pretty memory bound, like I said, that's why you have needed batching up until now. But with this release now, we can give you a hardware accelerator that you can get real-time A on, get your responses quickly, and get very, very competitive cost. So really, those trade-offs go away. One other interesting thing that we've announced, and, and I'll touch on this a little bit later, is that we're going to do this both for the cloud and the edge. And so uh, a lot of customers have real-time flows in their factories, in their warehouses, in their oil platforms, in their oil wells, uh, all, all you know, in, their, in their ships, uh, in their drones, in their airplanes, in their, uh, in their office buildings. I mean, all of these things have servers. And very often, you just, the, the, the data you're processing is so intensive, you don't want to send it all the way to the cloud, or you don't have time to send it all the way to the cloud. And so that's where real-time AI on the edge, and here in the edge I mean in servers that are on customer premises, is really important. There are also scenarios in the cloud 
that people care about. Like when your big data sets are in the cloud, you've got multiple data sets streaming in from multiple places, like think satellite imagery, and you want to correlate that with other events. And so there's definitely real-time uses in the cloud as well, but there's also a lot of real-time uses on the edge. And so when we developed this capability, we thought it would be really important for customers to have both. Now, the, the cloud offering is a little bit ahead, so we have people in production today, thanks to the great work of Ted and his team. And, and we are working through the details of the, the edge offering, uh, but we are in preview and we are working with partners. So now, I, we, I'd already talked a little bit about why we chose FPGAs rather than synthesizing a custom chip, but I wanna go, go over those advantages again because there's a lot of noise in the community. I mean, there's startups that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars, and so they really want, you know, they're talking about high levels of performance, and there's a lot of uh, uh, one-upsmanship uh, with metrics and benchmarks, and, and just a lot of chatter because the economic stakes are so high. So we really wanted, I really want to cut through that. And so the first thing we did with the Project Brainwave architecture is said we want to, we want to do this real-time thing, so we're going to get rid of batching. And that means you both want to have the, the high throughput that I mentioned and very low latency. And so performance there on the left was, was one of our primary goals. And so what we've been able to show is that we're actually, we have industry leading latency for the requests we're sending over to the FPGA. So the launch model we have is ResNet 50, which is a general image classifier, a, a very popular image based DNN. And of course, we, we're working with lots of partners on other models, and we've got a whole ton of models within Microsoft. And so we'll be rolling these out in pretty rapid succession. But on ResNet 50, no one has actually shown levels of performance at any batch size comparable to what we're achieving on FPGA. And we're, right now, we're hitting about, you know, from a local host to the, to the chip and back, about 1.8 milliseconds per image. And that number is continuing to drop. There was a little bit of a, because of all this, uh, the economic stakes and the numbers flying around, people have been pushing a meme that, well, if you build a custom chip, it's gonna be faster. And they talk about ASICs, application integrated circuit, which people typically think of as being very efficient because they only do one thing. But it turns out that all of these DNN accelerators are actually programmable. They're all programmable engines. They all have, they all have an architecture that you can program to because you wanna run different models. And that programmability comes at a cost. You want to be able to do multiple things, and you need to make design choices when you build the chip. So TPUs, GPUs, other NPUs, what I call neural processing units, coming in from all of these startups, and the Project Brainwave engine on FPGAs, and other neural network uh, implementations that people are doing on FPGAs are all examples of programmable accelerators. And uh, really, the, what you have to look at is the architecture at that top layer, not what is your deployment strategy, is it FPGA or custom chip or something else? And so what we've shown here is that we're able to achieve industry leading performance with the FPGA uh, by choosing the right architecture. And a lot of people had thought that that wasn't possible, but I mean, I think that a lot of that is just misconceptions and FUD. Uh, okay, and then I talked a little bit about the flexibility in that we can incorporate new discoveries quickly, we can tune the engine continuously so you get this rapidly improving stream of, of innovation, really without changing your software model. So we port, we port a model, and then your engine gets better and better over time. Now, of course, you know, we, can, we can do things that break the architecture if we get radical improvements, and that's always a discussion with customers. Um, you know, it's just opportunity, but we will support uh, backwards compatible models. Another really thing, interesting thing that we do, though, and this is something that we haven't talked about very widely yet, is that these DNN models are actually very different. You know, a convolutional network for image processing is very different from a recurrent network for, say, text processing or language processing. And there are many different kinds of networks now coming out of the research literature. These different networks actually have different requirements. And so what we do in the Project Brainwave system is we will actually generate images of the hardware accelerator that gets mapped on the FPGA that are customized for individual models or classes of models. And so if you have four big buckets of models, we can actually generate four variants of the engine that are tailored and streamlined to those models, as opposed to giving you a single fixed architecture that has to serve all types of models and where you have to make design compromises. And you have to pick those when you freeze the architecture 
and then that, that has to work for in two, three, four, five years. So we're able to, to shrink wrap the engine to fit models. And in fact, we even do things like pick the data types. You know, instead of 32-bit floating point or 16-bit floating point or 8-bit integer, you know, we actually might pick 9-bit floating point for this model and 8-bit floating point for this model. And that all happens behind the scenes. You know, we have a, in our tools, we have a flow right, that will take your models and cast them into the right data type and then pair those with an image of the project brainwave architecture that's been optimized for that model. So when you think about the edge offering, what you want to do, and we'll, I think I know we'll get into the details later, but you have a, you'll be running an Azure IoT Edge client on the server. It will connect up to Azure ML where you've trained your model, and it will pull down both your model and a version of the Project Brainwave engine that's been optimized for that model. And so really the FPGA images that implement that architecture and the models are paired tightly together. And so you can optimize it on a per model basis. That's a capability really that, that very few other offerings have. And that will also give you another boost in efficiency up beyond what we're doing just with the raw architecture and the real-time AI and the elimination of batching. And then finally, in, in our cloud, for the cloud offering, we have scale. So Microsoft has been putting uh, one of these FPGA boards in just about every new server it buys for three years. So Azure started in 2015. Bing has been doing this in about the same time frame. And so we've deployed massive numbers of these things. We have more scale than anybody else in the industry for this technology. And so uh, there, are some demo, there have been some demos this week uh, the uh, Esri demo in AI for Earth, where we're, I mean, it's been shown already, uh, right? Mark Wisenovich will show it. Oh, okay. All right. So I won't, I won't give it away, but should I, should I say it? Uh, okay. Well, go, to, go to Mark's talk. Yeah, go to Mark's talk and, and see the demo, but that emphasizes the, the very large scale at which we're operating. So uh, for customers that want to integrate very cost effective real time AI into their, into their businesses, you know, at the business site, we can do that. Our offering will do that. If you want to go into the cloud and, and intersect flows and do AI on those flows, we can do that. But then if you want massive scale, we can also do that. And that's one of the other advantages of, this, of the cloud. You get massive scale uh, and that elasticity. So if I want to do, if I want to be processing hundreds of millions of images in a very short time frame, we can scale out and get that job done for you. And so that's a, that's a really compelling capability that I think we're just even now starting to understand what that really means because there are all these big data sets and, and, but people haven't been able to operate at the scale on, and these speeds before. So it's gonna make new things possible, like just continuous monitoring of very large data sets, very large facilities, geographic regions. Uh, think about the power grid and what you might be able to do there with you know, millions of producers and millions of consumers as opposed to a few centralized producers like coal plants that you can move up and down. So just this worldwide scale is an opportunity to really start building control systems, but you need very large scale to run those control systems with AI. And that's something that we offer. Okay, and then uh, we don't really talk about cost compared to all the other technologies because you know, there's, there's a base cost and there's margin. What, what we've just been talking about is the cost to you, the customer. And so when you come to Azure for this offering and you want to get on Ted's service, his team service, and start classifying images for your business, uh, for your research, you know, for your personal life, whatever. The current cost of the current offering is under 20 cents per million images. And so that's what it costs you to rent the service, process a million images. You'll pay about 20 cents, actually a little bit under. I know it says 21 on the slide, but because we've been tuning the engine, uh, the costs have come down because the throughput has gone up since we made the slide. Okay, and, and I'm hopeful that, you know, in a few weeks it'll be 16 cents and then 15 cents. Um, I can't keep up, so we're just going to leave it at 21 cents and, and speak to it. Okay. And actually, I do think, Ted, we're going to be at 15 cents in, you know, in a few weeks, a month. Okay, so that's also, oh, that's also a really amazing thing. And, and this level of capability hasn't been available before. Go ahead. So the low cost is at, okay. Okay, yeah, so the question, I'll repeat the question for everyone. The, the, the low cost is at what latency? And the, it's a little bit of a nuanced answer, so I'm going to give you an honest answer rather than a marketing answer. Uh, so the, the low cost is, in, is at that real-time AI batch one offering, okay? And so today on the, on the, from the, from the, 
service hosting the chip. Like I said, it's 1.8 milliseconds. Currently, we haven't tuned the software stack as much as we might, so it's still a few milliseconds over to that server and back. Okay, so we're seeing today six to seven milliseconds end to end. Um, and we also haven't tuned the flow of images. So if you're using all uh, 24 cores, for example, on a host machine, driving all that data to the FPGA and then back, there's a bunch of queuing delay in that host machine that's driving up you know, another 10 milliseconds. So there is actually a, some additional latency when we're driving at very high throughput, but that latency is not fundamental and we're gonna be, we're gonna be driving it out uh, you know, over the next few months. So for example, like the, the time to the server and back is gonna go to near zero because we have this accelerated networking capability. And I might be getting over my skis, but I'm gonna keep pushing on that. Uh, so the, I think the marketing answer, which is also true, is that there's no, at that cost, there's no inherent extra latency built into the system. So it's still that industry leading latency of the chip, it's still batch size one, it's still real time AI. That's all true. Uh, just today when you're driving it at maximum throughput, there's, there's a bunch of queuing elsewhere in the system, not on the chip itself, uh, that's, that's adding some latency, but that's gonna come down over time. Okay, so like I said before, really we, what we want is no compromises. We wanna give you real time AI, very high performance, at that cost structure, which is continuing to drop. And I'm confident we'll get there. And it's already really good. Ted, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, so I think uh, the question from latency, like Doug said, um, if you were to send an image in the same data center as the FPGA, um, we're seeing about six milliseconds end to end. Um, and the, uh, so basically the service offering is about 42 cents an hour. And to run one million images takes about um, 31 minutes. And that's where we're coming up with that 21 cent mark. And it's continuing to drop. <laughs> I have to keep emphasizing that because our team has been burning so hard up till build. Right? Every, every cent we're squeezing down, I get excited by. Right? It's kind of a sad life. OK, so I think I've actually talked to a lot of this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say a little bit uh, about our internal technology because we don't have it quite ready for, for the public offering. So today, what we've deployed in Azure are servers that have four of Intel's really amazing ARIA 10 FPGAs on individual cards. Okay, so, those, so that's a you know, fairly standard high-end server, and it's got four of these cards. You've already heard the price structure to rent a single FPGA VM. Of course, you can rent multiple ones if you want more throughput, multiple boxes. What we've actually built within Microsoft, and we haven't brought this technology to customers yet, but I want you to see where it's going, and you saw it in the videos, this notion of a configurable cloud, so what we actually do within our infrastructure is the FPGAs talk directly to the network. And so they are network attached devices, which allows us to scale out with very low latency. And so what you can see here for very large models, and this is something we do in worldwide production today already, is if we have a really large model, we'll take it and then we'll just stripe it across those Fs there, those FPGAs that are talking to the level zero switches in the data center up to the level one switches. And so this is something that aspirationally I would like to bring to our customers because then you get the ability to run even larger models at even greater speed. So I think the, the point of this is that we do have a roadmap where there's some very advanced technology coming down the pike. We just have to figure out the cadence to get it into Azure and bring it to our customers. And then of course on each FPGA is that, you know, is that project brainwave hardware architecture that's synthesized down onto the programmable hardware that you can see over there uh, on the right of the chip. And so we've talked about the speed and this trying to eliminate this trade-off between cost and latency to first order, although we still have some tuning to do. And we've talked about the flexibility, which is another advantage where you get this continuous stream of updates and improvements, and you also get the ability to customize the engine for different models, which gives you an additional bump of efficiency over what you're able to do with other technologies. And then the last point that I really like to emphasize, and I think you've hopefully heard this, is the fact that we want to support many of the frameworks. We want people to use any framework that's popular that they bring to the cloud. And so we're, we're doing models in TensorFlow today. In fact, we'd like to run TensorFlow in lower latency than, than Google does with TPU. I think we're already there. But we want you to be able to bring CNTK, PyTorch, many others. And then we have this open source, open neural network exchange, Onyx format uh, that we will also be supporting. And so that is that many people in, in different frameworks will be able to 
party on this art, this infrastructure, and uh, and get great benefits without being locked into a vertical. Yes, question in the back. So the question was, do these ASICs become more cost efficient than the FPGAs? And I think may, maybe I'll use that, and I, I'd like to address that question now because I think it's a really important to, to, to address. So I'm a, I mean, I'm a long-time computer architecture researcher, and I'm actually a CPU architect by training. So, so maybe this is a new adventure. Um, but in, in the, if you want to be uh, sort of academic and nitpicky, ASIC, and I, I'm sure you know this many here may not, it stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. And typically what that means is a fixed pipeline that only does one thing. Um, all of these neural architectures that people are building, like I said before, are programmable architectures. And they can be synthesized, they're not really ASICs, they can be synthesized down to a custom chip, which is kind of how people are using ASIC today, that's become popular, or an FPGA. So now, if you decide, hey, here's, here's a, a, a neural processing unit or NPU architecture, that I want to run at very large scale, and I'm synthesizing to an FPGA, but I'm convinced it's not gonna change, and that the models, the class of models that it supports, as opposed to the other variants, is so big that I wanna optimize it for, for, for cost, I might be willing to pay the 50 million bucks and stamp out a hardened version of that where you know, the area is slightly lower. You, know, you can always take something soft, synthesize an FPGA, and make a more efficient copy, although it, you have to freeze the design, and it takes several years to do that and get it in deployment, and it costs some number of tens of millions of dollars. So there are scenarios where I think this makes sense, and, uh, but, but at least for us, you know, every quarter we ask ourselves the question, is it time to maybe take one of the engines of the many we, we synthesize on the FPGAs and harden? We haven't hit that point yet. We're still iterating it pretty fast. So in theory, it's possible. But right now, all the economics say no. This is the the path we're on is the right one, and and right and really, you know, we're right now we're at I think a very strong performance leadership position in the industry, while retaining all that flexibility. So it's a pretty good place to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, again, I, I think what really matters is the architecture you pick above that custom chip FPGA deployment vehicle. And so I'm just, as, a, as an ex-academic, and Ted, you might want to stop me when I'm running over. I don't know how we're doing on time. Five minutes. Okay. You know, what's really fascinating right now is that all of these different designs that people are building are all fundamentally different architectures. You know, Brainwave is actually a sort of an out-of-order vector data flow thing that looks under the hood more like a superscalar made of vectors, but at very much wider ILP or VLP. Uh, you know, the, the other start startups have massive numbers, thousands of statically scheduled tiny processors, which, so all the smarts is in the compiler. Google's got a, a systolic array. I mean, it's just, you know, all these old debates we had in the 80s about, yeah, it's all being replayed now for neural okay. networks and no one knows what the right answer is. So the people that pick the right architecture are going to do well regardless of how they, de how they deploy it. Um, again, but, you know, we're iterating and learning very fast, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about where we are. Okay, so we talked about scale, so I'll skip over that. And I think this is slide 15, isn't it? One more. Okay, well, I'm going to turn it over to Ted because I think this is where he can pick it up. Okay, cool. So I got done three minutes early. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. All right. <laughs> You've seen, this is the first time you've seen it, three minutes early. You saw it here first. Um, thank you, Doug. Um, I'm Ted, so I'm a PM on the Azure Machine Learning team, and, and Doug essentially described to you uh, the engine of a Lamborghini. You think about it that way. And, and it's a beautiful engine. It's super highly tuned and optimized, and it just hums. Uh, but it's, it's an engine. So from the product team, I'm here to give you the keys to that Ferrari and, and show you how you can drive it. Um, and so in terms of Project Brainwave, if we, as we talk about, um, the first thing is just ResNet 50. And so, so ResNet 50 is this deep neural network. The way I like to think about deep neural networks and, and, and how they can be flexible um, is in the context of a bomb-sniffing dog. So let's say you wanted to train a bomb-sniffing dog. At the end of the day, a bomb-sniffing dog is a German Shepherd. Right? So, so imagine you have a three-year-old German Shepherd 
German Shepherd has the infrastructure, if you will, to be able to take in smells and to be able to distinguish among smells in a very, very sensitive way. So that's what a German Shepherd is good at. But a German Shepherd is not a bomb sniffing dog. So what do you do? You give it some smells. You say, this smells like a bomb. This doesn't smell like a bomb. This smells like a bomb. This doesn't smell like a bomb. Three weeks later, you know, 20 boxes of kibble later, you have yourself a bomb sniffing dog. So training that German Shepherd to be a bomb sniffing dog is not that difficult. Building the German Shepherd, that's the hard part. <laughs> so essentially ResNet 50 coming out, of ResNet, uh, coming out of Microsoft Research is this German Shepherd. So when we launch with ResNet 50, now you have the capability of having a German Shepherd that we would be able to take in data, image data in this case, take out those features, and then to be able to train those features to do the things that you want to do. So as with a German Shepherd, now you have a bomb sniffing dog. Now you have a food sniffing dog and a fruit sniffing dog for your airport. Now you have a skin cancer sniffing dog, right? All these different things you can do. So, and, and um, I can't emphasize enough uh, for Doug and his team, the kinds of world-class researchers we have uh, to, be able to, uh, to be able to do that industry-leading performance. Um, and so in terms of uh, what we have from the uh, Azure Machine Learning integration, um, I think also Doug talked about no batching required. Um, I'm going to now talk about what that looks like uh, from Azure Machine Learning. Connecting with people from different cultures. Finding and treating cancer earlier. Making the world accessible to everyone. Today's breakthroughs in artificial intelligence come from deep neural networks using very large multi-layered models that need amazing amounts of computing power. Running these models at high scale, low cost, and ultra-fast speeds has always been extremely difficult. Not anymore. Project Brainwave unlocks the future of AI by unleashing programmable hardware using Intel FPGAs. And this delivers real-time AI at blazing speeds with no batching, no compromises, and no need to choose between high performance and low cost. Azure Machine Learning Accelerated Models, powered by Project Brainwave, enable data scientists and developers to easily train deep neural networks and deploy them to the world's largest configurable cloud with record-setting performance. ResNet 50 is an industry standard image classification model. Processing one image requires nearly 8 billion operations. Project Brainwave leads the industry in speed on ResNet 50 models with under 2 milliseconds per image with image classification that can be customized with your data. Jabil, one of the most technologically advanced manufacturing companies on the planet, maintains rigorous standards of quality control. Today, Jabil identifies manufacturing defects in electrical components using human judgment, one set of photographs at a time. What if Jabil could analyze thousands of quality control images in seconds using deep learning to reliably identify anomalies for people to examine more closely, making humans more effective and making the whole process faster and more accurate. Now they can, by using Azure Machine Learning Accelerated Models to train and deploy a model, whether in the cloud or on the edge. What can you build with accelerated real-time image processing? Detect spills or open freezer doors in your retail store. Conduct real-time medical image analysis. Inspect critical equipment. Track endangered species. And this is only the beginning. Accelerating with programmable hardware means Project Brainwave can evolve quickly to keep up with rapid innovation in deep learning. Microsoft is already using many models for text, audio, speech, and natural language, and will bring these models to you soon. You'll even be able to accelerate your own custom models and design the next generation of real-time AI applications. Start accelerating with Azure Machine Learning and Project Brainwave today. So let's talk a little bit about Azure Machine Learning and um, in terms of how it can integrate with, uh, with Project Brainwave. So Azure Machine Learning is an end-to-end -end data science platform. And you think about what data scientists do today. Data science is the sexiest job of the 21st century, but you talk to a data scientist and they're probably spending 50 to 80% of their time on very boring tasks like data cleaning and a lot of data janitorial tasks. So starting with the from, the, from an intelligent data preparation perspective, just having tools to be able to help you uh, get that data into a cleaner form that then you can process. 
Um, in terms of model training, giving you the flexibility of training your model on the compute that makes the most sense to you. Maybe you want to train a model very quickly on your local workstation, trying out different models and, and trying different frameworks just to see how you're able to uh, get something that seems to be promising. You want to do that quickly on a local machine. Then you might want to scale up to a Spark cluster, maybe run a cluster on CPUs. Now submit jobs to this big cluster that then you can train on to be able to train your model. Maybe for deep learning models, you want to spin up a GPU cluster using something like Azure Batch. So now you have a GPU cluster, spin up, submit your job to train, and then spin down again. So the integration of all of these various compute contexts, and now recently with the integration with Databricks too, uh, uh, to be able to train these models very, very quickly. Um, from a model management perspective, this is also starting to be very important. We were talking to the CIO of a Wall Street firm, and he was saying, we have 10,000 machine learning models in our firm. We get data from them, we make decisions from them, but I have no idea who created the models, I have no idea what their training results are, no idea of the performance. So what happens in that situation? So it'd be great to be able to get the results from a model, trace that model back to the source code, know the data scientists that created the model, know the training results and all of that. So that's becoming very, very important from an enterprise perspective. We bring in the best of open source. So whether you want to use Python, Microsoft Cognitive, uh, in Python, Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, Google TensorFlow, uh, Cafe, all of these different frameworks you're able to use in Azure Machine Learning because we know there's so much innovation happening in open source to bring you the best of open source. A lot of great features and functionality in open source, which is great. But some of the things that open source does not care about are the boring things like compliance and security and VNets and all those things that an enterprise cares about. So what we do with Azure Machine Learning is that we give you uh, the best of open source, the best of Microsoft, and then we package it up into an enterprise-grade end-to-end data science platform uh, for you to be able to build and train your models. And so the preview offering for Azure Machine Learning Hardware Accelerated Models is incorporated into this entire infrastructure, into this entire platform. So the same platform that you're using to train your models, deploy to CPU, deploy to GPU, deploy to the edge, you are now integrating to be able to now also deploy onto an FPGA. So, uh, so this is Python, this is TensorFlow, and then you're creating that model and then deploying it um, in a serverless architecture. So from an infrastructure perspective, just to give you a quick overview, um, our first region is East US. So East US is uh, what we're offering with a launch. If you were to deploy a model today, it would be in, each, uh, in East US. Um, each of these stamps uh, have 20 racks. Each of these racks have, uh, have a lot of boxes, and each of these boxes have four FPGAs. Um, this is like that story. I met a man coming from St. Kitts, and he had seven wives, and each wife had seven kits, and each kid had seven kittens, and how many were actually going to St. Kitts. Um, but basically, this is, the number, this is how we basically have uh, all of these in, um, in the data center. Uh, we're going to be adding new regions very soon uh, in West Europe, Southeast Asia, and South Central US. So these will be coming in the next few months um, so that you'll also be able to deploy models on FPGAs in these regions. And then we'll, we'll, we'll expand out from there. Um, in the actual Azure host itself, Basically, uh, we have the Intel ARIA 10 FPGA. We have four of them. And there's a wire service that basically is a thing that programs the FPGA. So, so Doug talked about this image that you flash onto the FPGA. So, so today is that highly optimized ResNet 50 image. Um, and then in this host, we have our VM. So uh, this is an Azure VM. Uh, currently, this is available uh, only to us as Azure Machine Learning. So we give you back an API. Uh, but we, would, we, would, we as Azure Machine Learning, we provision the VM, and then we flash the FPGA, and then we give you back that, that API. So on this. Um, on this VM, we have our VM extension. Uh, so when the VM is provisioned, um, the VM extension would talk to the wire service and the wire service, and we tell it to flash the FPGA. And then uh, that brain slice image is flashed onto the FPGA. Uh, this is the way that we talk to uh, Brainwave talks through the uh, VM to the actual FPGA. And on top of that runs our Azure Machine Learning. Um, and so basically, then we expose the gRPC API. gRPC is used for TensorFlow serving. as just a, 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 um, a way that people are able to, to expose these um, today. Um, and that's essentially what happens uh, underneath the covers uh, when we give you uh, this API. Um, we also have monitoring, et cetera, and all the, all the goodness that you would expect uh, from an Azure service. 
Um, the pipeline, which I'll be talking about, the actual model that you're deploying, um, will be running in the Azure Machine Learning runtime. Um, and so part of it will be running on CPU. So for example, maybe you're pre-processing. You're converting a JPEG picture into tensors. That's going to be running on CPU. Um, and then when those tensors are going to be run on the FPGA, that will go to Brainwave, which will then process that on ResNet 50, uh, on, on the FPGA for ResNet 50. Um, and then you might have some post-processing. Uh, post so once you get the extracted features, you're going to be uh, running that classifier, and that classifier then runs back on CPU. So the idea here is uh, we have highly optimized um, operators that can run things on CPU and FPGA, um, and then, and then um, accelerating that on, on FPGA. Uh, when you actually deploy a model, so basically, uh, again, using Azure Machine Learning, uh, and I'll go through the code and the notebook for this in a, in, in a minute, but you're just you're writing TensorFlow, you're using, uh, you're using Python and TensorFlow, that's doing that pre-processing, um, you know, converting those JPEG images into tensors, and then, and then deciding where you're going to run the FPGA, and then you might train a, a classifier um, at the final stage. Um, and then uh, after that, what, what happens is this service definition goes to our model management service. And this is the same model management service in Azure Machine Learning today, meaning that if this model, if this destination is about to go to an FPGA, great, model management uh, service knows about it. Maybe you created another model and it's going to be running on a CPU cluster, model management service knows about it. So in this way, you can manage all of the models in your enterprise. You know which models have been created and you know where those models have been deployed. So one centralized location uh, to be able to manage your models. The model management service talks to our control plane service. This is the control plane that will spin up and provision uh, that model. And this is just another view of that uh, VM where we uh, have that orchestrator. Um, the orchestrator might run the pre-processing on, um, on the CPU, and then it runs the ResNet 50 on Brainwave. And then for a classifier, then you have essentially, uh, again, TensorFlow um, classifiers that you might want to run. Um, we can also front this with a software load balancer. So right now, uh, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the throughput that we're seeing at about 1.8 milliseconds, we're getting about 530 images per second. But let's say you need you know, 2,000 images per second. So what we'll do is we'll just make lots of copies on, this, on these over multiple uh, VMs and then uh, front it with a software load balancer so that you can get the throughput that you would need. So essentially, this is the architectural diagram of what happens when you, when you click deploy. And I'll show you next that when you, when you run that one line to deploy a model, all this is happening underneath the covers uh, to, give you that, uh, to give you that API. So let's run to that right now to our, um, to our cloud service. Oh, OK. Sorry, this, let me see if I can. Uh... Apologies for this. Um, maybe, Doug, did you want to take any questions? Let me, let me try to remote back into my machine. Um, while, while I'm, yeah. Okay. So let me see if I, so I, you, you said that there's a bunch of different architectures like we discussed and which one do I think is the right one in the future? Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> it's a great question. I wish I knew the answer. Uh, we, we've taken... <laughs> Microsoft. Okay, the, uh, the, the trade-offs are really... I think three, threefold. One is how complex is the software interface? And so, for example, if you're providing a thousand cores 
and the schedule has to be static. That's one approach some people are taking. You're presenting, it's like the old VLW or Itanium world, but sort of in a much broader sense. It's a very, very uh, software intensive interface. And uh, those architectures, I'm not a fan of those architectures. They haven't worked super well in the past, but this time might be different. It may be that DNNs, which are linear algebra, are much more tractable for the software to manage. So I'm just kind of waiting to see. The, uh, the systolic array approach is really a throughput approach, right? So, so that's not one where you would, you, you know, that's actually, probably actually pretty good for training because, you, you know, you can, you can just bang through a lot of requests and work on slices. The, and then the approach that we've taken is, is actually we expose, Brainwave exposes a single thread of control with vector operations. So you have, you know, annotated C that gets compiled down to assembly instructions that are vector operations. And then those get taken and broken up into many, many, many sub operations in the hardware and scheduled on this distributed fabric and run as a dynamic data flow graph. So the advantages of that are that you, the, the programming model is pretty simple. The, the disadvantage is that you need a pretty sophisticated hierarchy of decoders, which we've built and is working. So, I mean, you've seen the results. And then uh, one another advantage you get is software compatibility. So if I want to roll out a new generation of FPGA or a new image, I don't have to change the program. I can just change the microarchitecture under the hood. And so I don't think we know how, why that can scale. But in the brainwave architecture, we actually have single instructions that are matrix vector operations that generate over a million math operations per instruction. And then those get fanned out to 130,000 parallel units that run for 10 cycles. So we do you know, 1.3 million operations in 10 cycles from a single instruction. OK, so now uh, I won't say which one is right. Are you good? Um, but uh, I do have my biases, and those are the trade-offs as I see them. Um, now, you know, if, you can, if, you, if the compiler can schedule all that stuff really well, then you can really lower the complexity of that decoder hierarchy that I talked about in hardware. OK, and maybe we'll, maybe I'll, we'll go back to 10 and take a couple of these questions um, once, we have a, once, once we're through the demo. OK, cool. Thanks. It's a great question, though. Thank you. Um, all right, cool. Uh, so just to walk you through a demo in terms of uh, what the experience will be, uh, we have our GitHub repo. And so when you clone the repo, uh, basically what you can do is run our quick start notebook, and you can set up an environment. Everything is packaged up in a nice Conda environment. And by just activating, uh, creating this and activating this, this will install all the dependencies for you uh, in your environment that you need. Um, and so next step here is you can see here, again, just Python, uh, TensorFlow, the uh, image preprocessing. This is where you are defining how you want to convert those images. So basically, we have just a bunch of nodes. And uh, the output of one node and the input to the next one uh, will just be tensors. So you'll be taking your JPEG images or your PNG images or whatever they are and converting them into tensors um, in the preprocessing step. The next step here is where you are loading a quantized version of ResNet 50. So, so this uh, super highly optimized version from Doug's team. Uh, what this means is that this uh, quantized version of ResNet 50 gives you the same results from CPU and GPU as you get on an FPGA. So now you can featureize your data on CPUs or GPUs. When you're training, uh, maybe you want to spin up a GPU cluster and featureize all your data. So you featureize it with this featureizer. The features will be the same as if they were running on FPGA, so that when you train your classifier, the classifier will be, uh, will be, uh, uh, um, will be performing very well. And so this is that quantized version of ResNet 50. Um, and um, moving forward, we're going to be enabling different types of models. So you can think about all the various models out there, NASNet, DenseNet, YOLO, and Inception, Inception ResNet, you know, a plethora of models. Um, but we'll also enable more models in the model gallery uh, that you'll be able to bring in. And then after that, you'll be training a classifier. And a classifier is essentially the thing that takes these features, and then you train that classifier. Um, and then we package up all of these into what we call a service definition. So your preprocessing step, uh, the step that runs on an FPGA, and then the classifier, all of this is in a service definition file, and, and, um, and that's what we take. When you deploy, 
Um, this is just your Azure subscription, um, subscription ID with your model management account. And again, the same model management account that you, you're using for Azure Machine Learning. The model management account that you're using to deploy models onto CPUs or GPUs, same model management account. Everything is incorporated into this end-to-end -end data science platform. And here's that one, one line that I talked about, this uh, create service line right here. And uh, all that we saw in the previous slide, uh, when you click this, when you, when you run this, um, it's going to take that service definition, it's going to get registered with model management account, it's going to go onto the FPGA VM, that model will now be on that VM. Uh, from a client perspective, now that you have this API that's exposed, you can call it. Um, and so here, I have a picture of a chip that, um, that Jbull might be interested in analyzing. So you think about a circuit board and you think about all the various components of a circuit board and you want to determine whether that, um, that passed uh, or failed the inspection. So let's click Run here and you can see just how fast it came back. So uh, this is uh, 14 milliseconds, um, so there's a little bit of overhead, but the time that it takes for this picture to leave my client machine, go to the FPGA API, uh, get converted from JPEGs to tensors, run the two milliseconds of ResNet 50, those eight billion calculations of ResNet 50, run through the classifier, get the results, send the results back to my client machine in about 14 milliseconds. You think about doing something like this on a CPU machine, we have a similar model running on a CPU, that end-to-end -end would be about 150 milliseconds, so 10 times uh, faster than a CPU implementation. Um, and so this is just the end-to-end -end on how you are able to now easily create and deploy uh, this model. Um, and so for those of you who were at the uh, talk yesterday, um, in, in uh, Joseph Sorosha's session, we built an app essentially that uh, looked at the performance of a CPU um, running this model on a CPU and running it on, an, uh, on a box that has CPUs and FPGAs. So in this case, um, you'll see that the, the needle kind of barely moves, but we're getting about four to six images per second on a CPU. So there's a, there's a, there's a model, we deployed it on a CPU machine. Um, it's running in the same region as our client app here, um, and we're sending images. We're using four concurrent threads to be able to send images, as many images as we can to the CPU model. Um, and here's the median latency, and here's the, um, and, and, and the throughput is about six, six images per second. Uh, so let's now start sending images over to the API uh, that's running the model on FPGA. And so you can see, just with one thread, I'm getting median latency of about six milliseconds. So six milliseconds um, to go end-to-end -end from image to API and back again uh, with the result. Um, and, and the reason that the throughput is actually pretty low is because I'm only using one thread to send one image one after the other. I can't send images fast enough uh, to this API. So let's slam this API and kick it up a notch, or eight notches here, and, and you can check out that kind of throughput that we're seeing. So um, the hit on latency is actually due to, again, what Doug was talking about, those queuing latencies, but if you had essentially uh, eight, you know, eight machines that were sending images to this API, you would be getting about six to seven millisecond latency and about uh, 530 to 540 images processed per second on that FPGA. So again, this is the type of performance that we're seeing, uh, 42 cents an hour, um, 21 cents for a million images, right? That's, that's what you get for one chip. Um, and that's, that's, that's everything uh, from our cloud offering. So this is the thing that you'll be able to do uh, when you, when you um, uh, clone that GitHub repo and deploy your own FPGA service. This is the type of performance that you'll be able to see. So remember that the FPGAs live in the East US data center, so your client machines should also live in East US. Um, otherwise, the network, uh, just, just sending images across the network to the API would, 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 be, uh, uh, would, would add a lot of latency there. So now the next thing I want to Actually, talk Ted, about. Can, yeah. can I interject Absolutely. one comment? So that, that six to seven that we talked about, you know, several milliseconds going to the, across the network and, and back. And in the video, we talked about our accelerated networking program, which we're actually not using. But the, I mean, we've announced that the VM to VM latency when you use accelerated networking, and we're going to be turning it on, you know, is about 25 microseconds. So just, uh, and actually, it's actually quite a bit lower than that, but I don't think we're supposed to say that. So uh, it's going to be dropping, dropping quite a lot. And so you start to see how with this hardware accelerated stack going going end to end, you can just hit incredibly low latencies all the way through. Yeah. Okay, sorry for the interruption. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is AI at the cutting edge. 
And uh, this is the integration with IoT Edge. Uh, maybe you've noticed this up here, this, this, uh, this box right here. Um, here I have a server rack with uh, two servers. Uh, there's, a, there's a Dell and a, a Hewlett Packard server there. Um, and so basically, now what we can have is putting these FPGA chips into these Edge devices. Um, and all integrated with Azure Machine Learning and Azure IoT Edge. So let me take a moment to talk about what Azure IoT Edge is. Um, Azure IoT Edge enables you to compose the same type of pipelines you would have in the cloud and bring it to an edge machine. And so why would an edge machine be important? So as Doug mentioned earlier, maybe you have an oil, you know, uh, uh, an oil platform out in the middle of the ocean. Uh, maybe you have a super secret nuclear uh, research facility and you have data that you don't want to touch the internet. Uh, maybe you have, you know, those thousand cameras in, in, in your facility that you want to process without having to send all of that data to the cloud. So what Azure IoT Edge enables you to do is to compose various uh, services and to containerize them in Docker containers. So your stream analytics, your Azure functions, or your own custom Docker containers can be incorporated with the IoT Edge runtime. And that would just be containerized, and then you uh, would be able to bring that down to the Edge and now this is running on the Edge device. You manage everything from the cloud. So for example, maybe you have 11,000 retail stores. Um, so from the IoT hub in the cloud, you would manage all 11,000 of these Edge devices. You would be able to configure and say, these are the models I want to run in Northern California. These are the models I want to run in the Eastern United States. You can configure that in the cloud. It's just a JSON document. And then you push all of that to the Edge. The Edge devices will then pull the containers from their respective uh, um, uh, re uh, registries to be able to bring down those containers, instantiate them, and run it. Um, and so this enables you to be able to manage from the cloud uh, in disconnected or non-connect or, or uh, scenarios in which there's very, very little connectivity. So you're saving on bandwidth, you're saving on latency, um, you're saving on cost when you can bring this down to the edge. And so what this means now is the same types of integration uh, could work. And so let's jump over to a different VM. And I know all the VMs are looking the same, but I'll show this VM right here, and, um, and this is an actual edge machine. So let me just pull up the device manager and just prove to you. You can see here that we have a Catapult FPGA device. So right here, right here in this machine, um, in one of these edge machines, uh, we have FPGA cards in there with an FPGA, and this is an actual FPGA in an edge device that you would essentially be able to deploy onto your uh, on-premise on uh, um, uh, locations there. Um, and then the same type of app that I can run. So I'm going to open up this uh, config file real fast. And just show here. Um, this, is, this is the IP of that VM here, 10.123.88.134, uh, right? So, so it's not, I'm, not, I'm not making a call off the box. I'm making a call on the direct machine um, that's happening right here. So let me run the demo again. And it's the same app, except now it's running locally on the machine. And let's just uh, start that running again, right? So same idea. Um, so what's happening here is the same thing, except now the the images are being sent, they're processed locally, um, and then um, let's kick it up a little bit more at the number of uh, threads. Um, there's still some things that we're trying to work. Uh, so basically what's happening with IoT Edge, because everything is container-based, uh, we're sending images from a container uh, to that API and getting it back. And so the latencies are a little higher. Uh, latencies are, and throughput's a little uh, uh, different on, on this Edge machine. But same, uh, same ARIA 10 FPGA, uh, same type of architecture, um, and the ability now to be able to process mass amounts of data um, locally on your Edge device. So um, this is something that we are uh, working with in, in a private preview. And so if you're, more, if you're interested in this type of scenario where you want to uh, have that FPGA on an edge device on-prem, then feel free to reach out to us and we'll be able to uh, chat with you more about it. Um. Um, so for us, I mean, like uh, for, for the cloud server, it's about eight, and then edge device, maybe we should just kick it up a little bit more. There's, there, there's some overhead with the containers. That's, that's the main reason that we have to, we have to work through. Um, 
And so really just to summarize everything we've talked about in terms of uh, Azure Machine Learning. Uh, Azure Machine Learning, hardware accelerated models powered by Project Brainwave. Um, we're really good at naming here at Microsoft, so you know exactly uh, what you're getting with our names. Uh, but essentially, <laughs> the, the models, the, you know, as, I, as, as we had covered, uh, easy to create just using Python and TensorFlow, and easy to deploy into the cloud, write once, deploy anywhere. Everything that I ran through in that Python, um, in that Jupyter notebook with that TensorFlow code, the model that you create can be deployed to the cloud and also deployed to the edge without changing anything. So write once, deploy anywhere. Uh, manage and update your models using Azure IoT Edge. So from that IoT hub, you can basically say, oh, data scientists created a new optimized model, works better. I'm going to push it to my edge devices. Now those edge devices have an updated model that are running on the FPGA. Um, and so uh, in terms of uh, next steps, we'd love for you to just go check out our GitHub repo to just uh, give it a shot and be able to deploy your own FPGA service and really just unleash the power of real-time AI. So thank you very much. So we have about eight minutes left to take any questions. I'll invite Doug back up here and to be able to address any other questions that folks might have. Yeah. Okay, let's start with the two. Yeah, mm -hmm. I got a Mac already. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, the Brainwave. I really like the product, but uh, the question is really about the Azure ML. Yeah. So uh, for Azure ML, uh, although I believe that the public cloud is the future, right? In the next uh, maybe a few years, there are still a lot of customers using a private cloud. So do you think Azure ML could support them uh, in some way? If yes, uh, what's the roadmap? If not, what's the blocking issues? Yeah, in terms of, so you're saying just a completely private environment that does not touch the cloud Deployed at all. Deployed ML at a private environment. Yeah, so, so this is where we might want to talk about uh, uh, ML.net uh, ML .net and also our uh, server offerings. So uh, Azure ML is a cloud offering that enables you to connect to experimentation services and to model management and uh, different types of services that, that will help you manage all of that. But we have a whole suite of on-prem offerings uh, that will also be able to uh, be able to run these things without ever having to touch the cloud. So those are things that we can talk about. Srikanth here is our engineering director for Azure Machine Learning, so I'm sure he has uh, more context to be able to speak to that. Yes. So, <clears throat> so you know, in terms of uh, working things on premises, certainly we have the ML server offering uh, that has high performance algorithms, so you can use that. Also, the models you build in the cloud in Azure ML. They're all containerized, so you can actually take the container and run them on premises, and actually you can choose to send the telemetry into the cloud if you want, or if you choose not to, so those options also exist. And as Ted said now, the Azure IoT gateway um, and the edge devices are another place where you can run these models. So. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. For workloads that are bursted in, nation, in nature, how long are we looking at to scale out and add new instances on the fly? If I realize I need more, I have more demand, how, how long does it take to increase capacity? Yeah, that's a great question. And so this is on the order of seconds. Uh, so basically what we have is a, we have a VM pool. Uh, we have a VM pool. Uh, today it's, um, you know, it's already flashed with a ResNet 50 image, um, and it's just a matter of copying your model file to it, spinning it up, and adding it to that, to that load balancer. And so it is somewhat of a manual process today. Uh, we don't have the automated way of being able to detect higher traffic. Um, so there will be some manual uh, work that you'll have to do to basically increase that pool. But once you say, I want to spin up some more, then you'll be able to add more fairly easily. Yeah, a well, great question. Thank you. Um, and, 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 and to, to that point, uh, what I also want to say is that um, from, from the experiences that we've had working with some customers in our preview, um, before GPU machines and CPU machines are so expensive that you want to be very, very cognizant about you know, how many you're actually provisioning at a given time and to be able to try to scale up and scale down as you need. Um, that's because they were just so expensive. Um, in a way, the FPGA machines are so cheap um, one, one customer, they just provisioned for their max, uh, the, for their max throughput, even though they may be only using this much at a time, and they may be using this much on, on bursty, and provisioning all of that was cheaper than doing it on a CPU or GPU machine, uh, or, or GPU clusters. So, so, th so that way, they didn't need to worry about it at all. It was even cheaper that way. So maybe the, the elephant in the room, maybe not. I, I don't know if you addressed Brainwave addressing uh, scaling for training the models. Is that so? When is that coming? <laughs> and 
get my uh, my mic on here. So uh, I don't know that if it's an it's an elephant in the room because Azure offers the leading edge NVIDIA GPUs today, which you can rent to train. No, no, so, I, 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 yeah, I mean, yeah. I, it was from the perspective of different silicon. Yes, that's right. That's <laughs> okay. right. We we haven't announced anything with respect to training at this date. So if there's an elephant in the room, I'm ignoring it. <laughs> Um, they are certainly free to do so, <laughs> but the, you know. So today, the answer is, you know, rent NVIDIA GPUs or Intel CPUs in the cloud to do scale out training, and uh, when we, if and when we have offerings that are uh, that add value for our customers, we'll roll those out. I mean, that would be really good cost value for training the best on the cloud. Uh, well, if you had something that was provide a good cost value, then we would bring that out to our customers. So the, so the question is, what kind of hardware was on that drone that was introduced? Yeah, so we're actually working with a bunch of different hardware partners uh, in terms of, uh, when you talk about IoT, um, we actually have a session this afternoon at 4.30 where we're going to be focusing on IoT and Azure Machine Learning and all the various uh, deployment targets for that. Uh, so FPGAs, um, and also we, we just also announced that partnership with Qualcomm and Qualcomm and their chips, uh, uh, the 605, uh, to be able to containerize the models and deploy them and accelerate them on the Qualcomm chips. Um, and then in the drone itself, um, I think I think they were the uh, GPUs that were running in the drone, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah, Nvidia GPUs. Yeah. Uh, yes. Right, PCIe. I think it's a Doug PCIe. Yeah, yeah, PCIe to connect from the FPGA to the. The other question is, we, uh, what about having this work on two edge devices? What you have here is like on mm -hmm. But if you have an industry that sells devices and you are not really in control of the premises, so to speak, what, what would it take to make this work on an edge? Like a FPGA come in all sizes. It would, in theory, have the genre of two IoT cars. Is there are there some plans to? Uh, sorry, if you, uh, uh, so maybe I, I, okay, I can, can, I can I'd be happy to take this. So what we're, yeah, the, I'm happy to. The, the question is, uh, are we planning to take this to lighter weight IoT edge devices, you know, with potentially smaller FPGAs? And I would say that if you look at the other partnerships that we've announced in the containerized ML, really, uh, you know, Azure is one going to be one of the very small number of global computers uh, with just massive number of cloud hubs talking to you know billions and billions of, of IoT devices and AI and ML are a central part of that and so I don't think we want to be tied to one particular technology what we want to do is be able to push the best AI we have to all of the endpoints with this offering what we're what we're showing is that we can hit really differentiated high-end performance and cost in the cloud and on what I'll what I like to call the heavy edge, I don't think this terminology is really settled. And then when there are for other lighter IoT nodes, there's going to be, a, I think, a lot of churn in different technologies. And whatever ends up being the victor there or, or the set of, uh, when things stabilize, the set of technologies that get deployed, we will serve advanced ML models to those. So if we think we can do it with smaller FPGAs in partnership with Intel, for example, that would be a great, great offering. Uh, if it's other technologies, you know, that may also be good. So we're, I, th I think we'll be agnostic. What we'll try to do is just make all of that better. Um, yes. Yes. Yes, thank you, Rashmi. So there's a, there's a booth with a working working servers with real FPGAs and the servers that are actually working uh, in the IoT Edge booth and in the expo hall. So, so I think, uh, thank you, Rashmi, for reminding me something to see. Um, and, and so we're running out of time, but well, the, the thought I want to leave you with is in terms of the direction that Microsoft is going uh, with all of this. Um, you probably saw the mail two, two months ago from Satya. I think you probably saw it on Twitter 
sooner than some of us saw just because of the time <laughs> it took for all the emails to get through through Microsoft. Um, one of the main things that came out of that was the, uh, the combination of a team in Bing, the AI platform team in Bing, and the cloud AI platform team from Azure. Uh, typically, you know Microsoft as fairly schizophrenic or maybe even with 27 different types of personalities. Um, and what happens is, you know, the Bing team are dealing with uh, uh, their Bing scale problems and they have a set of tools and, and things that they're using for them. And then we make some other set of tools for our end users and customers. And, and, and that just didn't make sense. And I think we're finally starting to see the light and organizationally uh, combine so that this is one of those things where the, the same problems that the Bing team have been trying to solve, the tools that they're using, the technology that they're using, we are enabling and bringing out to you. Um, and so this is, this is one part of that. You're just going to see that more and more and more. Uh, and so we're super excited about just all of the great things that we can now bring to you as the end customer um, and as the end user. So starting with something like Brainwave and ResNet 50 to really help you um, accelerate and get real-time AI. So thank you so much for your time today. Yeah.